Hey guys, welcome back to Bible Unplugged. I'm Wave Nunley, and we're in the middle of, actually at the end, of a series on the genius of Jesus, a journey into the mind of the Messiah, and looking at the aspects of Jesus' creative ability um, that He integrates into His teaching. So, in the past, we have looked at uh, different Jesus' different use of various literary forms, um, we've looked also in um, se section session two on the use of visual aids, and then in the most recent uh, segment, we dealt with Jesus' interesting use, unique use of prophetic passages and the way that he interprets those. Uh, in fact, in that last episode, we talked about Jesus' use of a uh, phenomenon that I call, an approach that I call historical stratification, of taking a prophetic verse and then assigning a part of that to one time period and assigning the second part of it to a completely different time period and how that was working in his culture at large as well. Well, today in our last segment, our fourth segment of four, uh, we are going to be looking at uh, an additional uh, aspect of Jesus' Bible interpretation and how that corresponds to the way that his contemporaries, the rabbis, uh, the leaders of the Pharisaic movement were also interpreting Bible. Uh, to do that, we're going to be looking at not historical stratification, but a whole other component of the Bible interpretation methods uh, that were in vogue in Jesus' day in the land of Israel and among the Pharisaic or rabbinic community. In uh, the generation prior to Jesus, there was a major famous rabbi by the name of Hillel. In fact, he was probably the most influential rabbi that has ever lived. He founded a dynasty that um, uh, continued with his son and then his grandson, whose name is Gamaliel, who actually shows up in our New Testament in the book of Acts. And so, um, uh, he founded a dynasty and he also established for the rabbinic community a uh, system of Bible interpretation that consisted of at least seven different approaches to interpreting Scripture. These were already in place prior to Hillel's day, but he kind of canonized or codified them and uh, placed his sanction on them and they began to proliferate and be used even more in the rabbinic community in the generation prior to and up to Jesus' birth. By the time that Jesus shows up in the temple as a uh, young, uh, as a boy, uh, Hillel has probably passed away and um, so he is the leader of the Pharisaic movement in the generation prior to and even including the early life of Jesus. So where do we go to get this information? We go to a uh, text from the Tosefta, uh, from the tractate that's called Sanhedrin in chapter 7. And in chapter 7 of Tractate Sanhedrin of the Tosefta, one of the earliest collections of rabbinic stuff, we get this reference. Seven matters did Hillel the elder expound before the elders of Patira. Then they list the seven, and then at the end of that list of seven uh, different approaches, it says, these are the seven midot, or methods of Bible interpretation and argumentation that Hillel the elder expanded before the elders of Patira. What I did was I put a line of um, yellow dashes in for those seven. What exactly were they? So this is the, the, on this slide, it lists all of them, all seven of them. You'll notice that the ones in the middle are of much smaller font. I included those for purposes of completeness, but also for those who want to um, use this um, uh, series as part of a curriculum for a Sunday school class, a home Bible study, a small group uh, that meets regularly. Um, I wanted you to have all of them. What we're going to do is focus on the first two and the last one for our study today. So what are they? Well, the first one is a an approach called Kalvachomer. Literally, it means from the, the light to the weighty, or from the lighter to the matter, from the le less important to the more important. 
It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. We will be looking at examples uh, from the rabbis as well as Jesus. The second one that we're going to do is called Gzira Shava, and it later became known also in rabbinic literature as Hekesh. It literally means a smiting together of two Bible passages so that once we get them both on the table, we understand, come to a better, uh, a clearer understanding of the verse that is in question. It's an argument from a similar word or a phrase or a sentence construction or structure that are found in, that's found in two or more verses of the Bible. These others, feel free to take a look at uh, on your own in your own study or with a group. We're going to skip to the seventh of the seven midot or methods or principles of Bible interpretation expounded by Hillel in the generation prior to Jesus. The last one that we're going to look at is Devar Halamed Mi Inyano. It, it basically means a matter that we are able to learn or understand from its area of interest, basically from the immediate literary context that a passage occurs in. It means you look for context clues in that, um, uh, in that Bible verse that you are concerned about its interpretation. You want a clearer understanding of its meaning, and so you look for context clues in that immediate vicinity of that verse. So this session, again, we're going to look at three approaches that Jesus used from those seven uh, midot, or principles, methods of interpretation, expounded by uh, the great Rabbi Hillel. Kal Vachomer, arguing from the lighter to the weightier, from the less important to the more important. Gzira Shava, or Hekesh, the later term used arguing from two verses that share a common component, a word, a, 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 a phrase, or a sentence structure. And then finally, Devar Halamed Mi'inyano, basically understanding a Bible verse better by paying close attention to what's going on in that immediate vic vicinity um, of that particular passage in question. Conclusion drawn from the context that, uh, of the verse and where the question comes from. Let's look at Kal Vachomer first. Lighter to the weightier, lesser to the greater, from the less important to the more important. So, from the rabbis, and this is what we'll do. In this session, we'll look at what the rabbis have to say, uh, how they use a certain midah of Hillel, a, a Bible interpretation method, and then we'll look at uh, one or more from uh, the words of Jesus. So this one comes from BT, is Babylonian Talmud, the tractate is Bava Batra, and this is what the rabbis have to say about Psalm 139. How precious are your dear ones to me, O God! If I, if I should um, understand them or try to count them, they're more numerous than the sand, the, the, the sand uh, on the seashore. The question comes, how can they possibly, how can the, the, the uh, people of Israel or those precious to God outnumber the grains of the sand upon the seashore? Well, the rabbis suggest, rather, this verse is saying, if I count the deeds of the righteous, not just the individual righteous people, but all of the, all of the things that they do in obedience to God's Word, then they are greater in number than the grains of sand on the seashore. Now, the same passage continues. This can be seen by a kal vachomer. Remember, an argument from the lighter to the weightier. This kind of argumentation, if the grains of sand that are fewer in number can protect the shore from the sea, from it in, in, intruding into the dry land, prevent it from flowing inland, then all the more so do the deeds of the righteous, which are greater in number than the sands on the seashore, protect them, the people who are doing them. Therefore, the sages, the rabbis, the rabbinic figures, they don't need any additional protection um, from amulets or whatever, um, spells and that sort of thing. So they're playing off of this idea of Jeremiah where God says, I have enough power where I set a small little rim of sand around the shore of the sea and that protected its intrusion. Well, how does, that's an example of Kal Vachomer. 
If this, then all the more so something that is more important, something that is weightier. How does Jesus use this? Take a look at one of the passages that we have only recently looked at when we were dealing with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, look at the birds. Very importantly, Luke says that Jesus' original word was look at the ravens. He's specific about what kind of bird. Look at the ravens of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, and they don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more? That's the language of Kal Vachomer. There's this, and then there's thing that so, the, the, something that is of much more weightier, heavier Im, uh, importance or significance. Are they not of much, much more worth than uh, than, than the birds of the air. So I put a bunch of Bible verses down here at the bottom that Jesus is very clearly playing off of. His worldview is informed by the Bible. By the way, ours should too if we call ourselves followers of Jesus. Uh, in Genesis 1, in Genesis 9, in Psalm 8, we're told that God created man as the apex of His created order and is therefore ruling over all of the rest of the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, etc. In this passage that I have highlighted in yellow in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah is actually fed by ravens. And that may be the Jesus' point of original departure, connecting his words with a figure that would hearken his listeners back to this passage in 1 Kings. Ravens are um, animals that are a, a whole lot like buzzards. They, they get their food from uh, dead animals and the like. And so they're, they're doing something that is completely against their nature. They've worked for that food that they're bringing to Elijah, and yet they're bringing it to him anyway instead of eating it themselves or giving it to their young. God is involved in feeding both the ravens, but in this situation, the apex of his created order, man, as represented by Elijah. Uh, we have these other passages that I've included, especially Psalm 104, which is a celebration of how God takes care. He exercises His providential concern and provides for all of His created order, human beings as well as the animal kingdom. And so this may also be in Jesus' mind when He's dealing with this business of look at the birds. They don't do all of these man kind of generated activities and yet God takes care of them as well. So you have this beautiful how much more. If God takes care of birds, He's going to take care of of you, more important, human beings created in His image, apex of His created order, and a, a beautiful use of Kal uh, uh, by Jesus. Now, you may be saying, well, you know what, I've read that passage before, I've heard it read, I'm familiar with it, and I never really paid that much attention to the terminology. That's the importance, in fact, that's the power of connecting Jesus' words with the original context from which they come. The greater clarity that that brings, brings an impact into our lives and we receive it in much more the same way that Jesus' would, uh, Jesus original audience would have understood His teaching. And that, after all, is the goal anyway, is to get what Jesus intended and how He was communicating to that original audience. And that then gives the Spirit of God an opportunity more to work with in transforming our lives to be more like Him. Another example, are not two sparrows sold for a penny or a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father's knowledge. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered, so don't fear, you are of much more value than many sparrows. So, not exactly sure why Jesus is so dialed in on birds in a comparison with the value of human beings, but He is at least in two places in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6 as well as chapter 10, comparing this apex of the created order, mankind, to that of the animal kingdom, and especially he chooses to use birds for whatever reason. Much more is the language of Kalva Homer, argument from the light to the weighty. Here's yet another one. We get this back in the Sermon on the Mount. 
If God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today, tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will He not much more do uh, so for you, O men of little faith? There is again that language of kalvachomer, when you use of much more or how much more, that's Jesus using this popular um, method of Bible interpretation and application, even when the verse in the Bible of the Hebrew Bible is not necessarily repeated, quoted there, it's running in the background and he's using this method of argumentation to interpret and to apply. Beautiful example of Jesus using what is popular in his culture to communicate clearly to his original audience. Another, by the way, this seems to be a quite, quite a uh, popular um, method for Jesus because we have this how much more sort of language uh, at least a half a dozen times just in the Gospel of Matthew. We've got about it four times or so in the Gospel of Luke for a combination of almost a dozen of these Kalva Homer kinds of arguments where it's really clear that he's doing it because he uses the very language of Kalva Homer, the argument from the lighter to the weightier. Here's a second one that we promised that we would take a look at, and that is Gzira Shava or Hekesh, smiting two verses together, uh, arguing from two verses that share a common word, a phrase, a sentence structure, or whatever, in order that the reik, the Hebrew word reik, we dealt with that when we were talking about reika and um, Jesus' uh, instruction on being careful about how we speak about our fellow human beings. Rake or empty uh, and the, or, or unclear, the verse is clarified by the male or the full, um, the understood, the clearly understood meaning of another verse that has something in common. Got to have a common word or phrase or sentence structure. Gezira shava or hekesh, smiting two together. We call this today uh, Scripture interprets Scripture, or some um, communities of faith refer to that as the analogy of faith. So this is not something that we are completely unfamiliar with, as maybe we were with Kalvachomer, but this is something that grows out of the Protestant Reformation and has been a part of Protestant Christianity for more than a half of a millennium, over 500 years. Scripture interprets Scripture. So let's take a look at one from the rabbis, another one from Jesus. There's a Midrash text called Sifra. It is the earliest um, Bible interpretation or commentary of the book of Leviticus. And so, um, this by the way is probably uh, the book, the book of Leviticus, probably the book that Jesus learned his Aleph Bet and how to read and begin to interpret and memorize the scriptures because that's the, that was the curriculum of the first century in the land of Israel for reading and writing. So in Sifra we read this passage from Leviticus chapter 1. The priest will pinch off, uh, most modern English translations read to wring the neck, but will pinch off the bird's head as a part of a bird offering. Um, this comes from Leviticus chapter 1. I might think from anywhere along the throat, in other words just you know get the general area right. However, um, I re so I reason that um, Malika, this pinching, is written here, but it's also written somewhere else. Where, if we don't know exactly where along the, the neck of the, um, of the bird that's to be sacrificed, where the head is to be pinched off, and it's kind of gross, but it's still an interesting passage, um, it is, it's, it's, it's written elsewhere. So where do we go to find that? He shall pinch off its head alongside its oreth in Hebrew. That is the back of the head that slopes down to the nap of the neck, um, uh, where the neck joins the body. So just as Malika, there in chapter 5, verse 8, that's this second passage, is alongside the oreth, so also, evidently, because we're still talking about pinching the neck of the bird to kill it in preparation for sacrifice. Uh, if it means that in one place, it has to mean that in the other place. That's one uh, Bible verse 
interpret, helping to interpret another Bible verse whose meaning is not completely clear. And why do we have the right to smite or hekesh, uh, put these two together? Because there is common terminology to both um, uh, of these Bible passages that allow us to link them together. One helps us to better understand the other. How about with the, uh, the teachings of Jesus? In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, um, the, the, uh, someone comes to Jesus and asks, asks Him, what is the great commandment of the law? And He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. A passage from Deut Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus says, this is the great and foremost commandment. And then, most English translations have the word the there. It's not there in the original Greek. So I've, I've struck that out with a, uh, with a strike through. And it's basically, a second is like it. Like it, to be compared to it, similar to it. Has some sort of an inherent connection. And, and we'll see what the connection is. The second one, which comes to us from Leviticus 19.18, is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm asking you, in order to make this hekesh work well, work correctly, there's got to be some common word, phrase, or sentence structure, composition, um, common to both. And so what would that be? Yep, you would be right. And I've cheated for you a little bit. I've put this in yellow. You shall love and you shall love. When you say, well, yeah, that kind of language is all over the place in the Bible, so why would it not be, you know, connected to or related to some other passage? Something other than this connection between Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. My response is, in Hebrew, no, you don't have all over the place, you shall love and you shall love. You only have three places in the entire Hebrew Bible where it is ve'ahavta, you shall love. So Jesus has put two of those together here for us. A le totally legitimate gzirah shava or hekesh. Connect these together and basically what you end up with is you shall love people in the same way that you love God. Or said another way, if you truly love God, then you'll demonstrate that because love is an active verb in Hebrew. It's an action word. It's not a state of mind or some kind of an emotion of the heart. It is you do love to other people. In fact, you'll have the word le after that. Do love to God. Do love to your neighbor. Do love to the alien that dwells among you. It's something that you actively do. It's an action, not some sort of a sentimental feeling, at least in the language of the Hebrew Bible. Um, so, it's basically, if you say that you love God, then you should show that love to those created in His image. Isn't that beautiful? And by the way, this is not some kind of guesswork because Jesus will, in Matthew 25, He'll say, as you did it to the least of these, or you didn't do it for the least of these, you've done it or not done it to me. So He makes that immediate uh, connection, as does also His uh, disciple John the Apostle. In, uh, the first, in the little letter of 1 John, he says, How can you say that you love God whom you haven't seen when you are not showing love to your brother whom you have seen? So those guys that studied under Jesus sure got this point. By the way, you get this from Jesus' brother as well. The, gospel, the, the uh, letter of James has in chapter 3, it says, How can it be that we, with the same mouth, that we bless our God and Father, but then with that same mouth we curse uh, uh, men who are created in God's image. And James' con conclusion is, brethren, it shouldn't be that way. So we should be, according to Jesus, and according to this application of Gzerah Shava, or Hekesh, we should be understanding how we love God, how we demonstrate, do, actively love to this God that we claim to love by doing acts of love to those created in His image. Absolutely beautiful and basically the foundation of this ethic of loving neighbor, of loving others that you get in early Christianity uh, and onward. 
The Gospel of Luke makes it even more clear. You shall love the Lord your God. This is the same uh, version of the story. It's just Luke's wording of it. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And so he stitched these two together without even having to repeat the verb. They're so closely, so intimately connected that he's borrowing the verb from, the, from Deuteronomy 6 and, in, and not even having to repeat it when he's quoting Leviticus 19. That is absolutely telling us that Jesus is wedding these two scriptures together in a way that they absolutely, they just belong together naturally because they're using the same language. The same language is so inherent in both that you don't even have to state the verb when quoting the second verse. Here it is in Hebrew, and even if you don't read the Hebrew, you can see these three instances in the whole Bible where this word occurs. And by the way, we did a whole segment on this about loving neighbor as yourself, and uh, you can go back and take a look at that if you want to dive more deeply into this. But Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 Deuteron Leviticus chapter 19, and then Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34. Just a few verses later, it is ve'ahavta. And the, this is loving God, loving your neighbor, and loving those that are not a part of your people group. That's uh, loving your neighbor uh, as yourself, and loving the stranger here in the third example, as yourself. These are the three Vahavtas in the whole Hebrew Bible and just uh, beautifully connected. In Luke chapter 10, he actually will refer to this third loving the stranger by inserting the intentionally the Good Samaritan into the story. That person is supposed to be loved like neighbor and like God. Active demonstration of love. Now we get to the third and final um, example of the use of Hillel's seven midot. This is the seventh, the last one. And it's Devar Halamed Me'enyano. It's a, a, something, a conclusion, an interpretation that is drawn from the context clues in the immediate vicinity of the verse in question. In other words, this is. This is, this is like the rule of immediate literary context that we use in Protestant hermeneutics or Bible interpretation. So let's take a look at one um, example from the rabbis and then another example from Jesus. So we're back to Sifra, this uh, earliest commentary on the book of Leviticus. And it, it, in, in the Leviticus 14, they're dealing with the rules about how to um, handle a situation of leprosy outbreak. He, sa he says, I'll put a plague or spot of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession, the land of Israel, going in. If God does that, then what do you do? Well, this implies that a house that has that has stones, wood, and mortar is susceptible to this kind of uncleanness. Well, why is that? Because stones, wood, and mortar are not repeated, are not given in Leviticus 14.34. The passage continues. However, I might think, this is the rabbi speaking, I might think that even a house lacking these stones, wood, and mortar is also susceptible. Therefore, it's written in the Torah, in the scriptures, in the same book, in the same chapter, just a few verses later, in other words, in the same immediate literary context, in that same mi in yano, um, in, in its same area of interest, then he shall break down the house, its stones, its wood, and all of the mortar of the house. All right? From the end of the same passage, we are learning that a house is not susceptible to uncleanness unless it has these three components. So that rules out all other houses that don't have the three, and it includes all these houses that do have the three. In other words, they have clarified the meaning of the previous verse by reference to a passage in, the, in an adjoining verse that's still dealing with the same subject and the same issue. How do we deal with a leprous outbreak that afflicts a home? 
Um, so that's interpreting from immediate literary context. Let's watch Jesus do this. The, the Sadducees come to Jesus who don't believe in bodily resurrection of the dead and eternal life in the way that the Pharisees or that Jesus, the early Christian community, and that we today believe. So they come and they say, um, Jesus, where's your proof for this whole idea of resurrection of the dead? In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says, Regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? God has already talked to you about this. Really, I don't, you don't hear a whole lot in the Torah, the first five books, about bodily resurrection. But this is what Jesus says. The passage he quotes, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Haven't you read that? Okay, well let's take a closer look at the immediate literary context, at the context clues provided right around the area of that passage which is in question. That passage that doesn't seem to be totally clear to you. And what do we get? The verb, I am, it's not I was the God of Abraham, you know, back when he was alive, back when he walked the earth. It's not, I'm, I will be the God of Abraham in some futuristic kind of disembodied spirits up in heaven. He says, I'm still the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So if the verb is in the present tense, that means God's still on the scene, and it means Abraham is still, his life is still moving forward. So also is Isaac's and Jacob's. Their lives are present realities. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the founders of the people of Israel are not dead. They are still very much alive and they are still in relationship with God. The, he is at this point still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and they're still in relationship with Him. So Jesus has circled the wagons and He said, let's look more closely at this Bible verse in question and look at here. We've got a present tense reality. Hope that that's a reality in your life as well. I'm living that out as, uh, myself and enjoying every minute of a current, up-to-date, day-to-day relationship with God. You know, so this is the sort of stuff that we do at Bible Unplugged. We're trying to bring you not the dashboard, not the, uh, not the um, plastic Jesus, but the real historical Jesus, not the Jesus of tradition or the Jesus of dogma, but rather the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of a first century Jewish reality, Hebrew-speaking reality in the land of Israel. And what I'm finding is that the more we dial in on the person of Jesus in His context, the more clearly we see Him. You know, I've made mention of this before in this series. I'm going to do it here as we close it off and, and, and say so many times I've said and I've heard other people say, you know, I just want to get to know Jesus better. Well, the way that you get to know a person better is you listen to them. You spend time with them. You, you g connect with what makes them tick. And so instead of leaving that in that kind of nebulous or amorphous sort of, I just want to know Jesus better, almost like a, a, a New Year's resolution, just kind of like a wish, let's put some, some flesh on those bones. Let's determine that we are going to dig into Jesus in His original context, not drag the Bible kicking and screaming into the 21st century. That wouldn't be fair. But to immerse ourselves into the mindset, into the thought patterns, into the social situations, into the, what made that rabbinic world tick, Bible interpretation included as we've seen uh, today. And the better that we come to know Jesus in His original context, the better we get to know Him as a person in our own lives. And the more the Spirit of God has to work with us on the inside of us to mold us and shape us purge us, prune us, and purify us, and conform us to the image of the Master that we have devoted ourselves to. That has been the goal of this entire series on the Jesus, the genius of Jesus. I hope that you have benefited from each one of these four uh, videos and that God is using that 
to reveal Himself more clearly to you and to conform you more carefully, more completely into His image. If that has been the case, please feel free to share this with other folks. Please feel free to take this to your small group leader, your Sunday school class teacher or whatever and encourage them to make use of these series as a part of their uh, curriculum. I trust that as you do, God is going to bless other people through you. And after all, that's the goal, right? What we have, what we have received freely, we're giving out freely. So God bless you as you serve Him. We'll see you the next time um, in the next segment of Bible Unplugged.